last video, we were introduced to the basic Marcus theory model, which used parabolic potential energy surfaces for D and A and D plus and A minus, the reactants and products for electron transfer respectively, and the key molecular level insight that inner sphere and outer sphere reorganization of DNA and the solvent can all happen at the same time, so that we don't need to invest the entire reorganization energy to get over the activation barrier for the reaction. The activation barrier is in fact much smaller. In this video, we're gonna start looking at situations where delta G for the reaction for the electron transfer is not equal to zero, which is of course extremely common. In fact, the self-exchange reactions that we looked at in the last video were relatively esoteric. And some interesting things are gonna pop out of this analysis associated in particular with strongly exergonic reactions, which is a very common situation for photo-induced electron transfer and one that's worth thinking through very carefully for that reason. So we can divide up electron transfer reactions into two cases energetically, either exergonic electron transfer where we are pulling down the potential energy surface for the products so that the overall energy difference of the equilibrium situations for D plus A and D plus A minus is negative, right? D plus and A minus are lower in energy than D plus A. And endergonic energy transfer, where we start pushing that product potential energy surface up in energy, and now we have an uphill situation overall if we look at these energy wells. Endergonic energy transfer reactions behave as expected with respect to their activation energy. The activation energy of the reaction increases as delta G increases. As the reaction gets less favorable thermodynamically, the activation energy goes up. And just to emphasize that, let's highlight the activation energies on this graph. They are here, here, and here. And, and we can see the path followed by the representative point is something along these lines, up along the reactant surface and then down along the product surface like so and we have to surmount a higher barrier for a more endergonic reaction and that's what we would expect that that's our thermodynamics kinetics intuition and all that good stuff the same thing roughly applies in the exergonic case that as we move to more exergonic reactions say from here to here to here the activation energy of the reaction decreases Something strange is happening in this third case where the two potential energy surfaces intersect at the equilibrium position of the reactant surface. We'll come to that in one second, but before we advance, just a couple of mathematical points. We're treating these potential energy surfaces as parabolic. This means we can mo model the reactant potential energy surface using this equation, the free energy is equal to x squared, it's simply a, a parabolic function of x, the nuclear coordinates, including the solvent. The product potential energy surface is shifted both horizontally and vertically with respect to the reactant surface. The vertical shift can be modeled by the delta G, the thermodynamic delta G, and the horizontal shift is equal to the square root of the reorganization energy. This is because at x equals zero, the value of g is equal to lambda. And so the square root of lambda squared is what pops out of that when x is equal to zero. That's equal to lambda, and so that makes the reorganization energy work on this potential energy surface. The point where we are at the transition state is where the two potential energy surfaces intersect, where the two g values are equal. And when we set those equal to each other, and we look at what is the energy value at that point relative to where we started, which was at the zero of energy, just by definition, based on the way we set things up, we arrive at this expression for the dependence of the activation energy of the reaction on the reorganization energy, number one, that's a parameter that we need to think about here, and the thermodynamic free energy difference. So this equation may not look like much, but there's some important physical insight built into this thing. Delta G equals lambda over four, which we saw at the end of the last video, pops right out of this when you set delta G equal to zero. That's one important physical intuition. Another important intuition is that this equation is quadratic in delta G. In particular, it's quadratic in this sum, lambda plus delta G. So when delta G is equal to negative lambda, and this is at zero, we are at a minimum of the activation energy. 
And in fact, the activation energy is equal to zero when delta G equals negative lambda, making the delta G either more negative or more positive than this value will cause the activation energy to increase. There's something strange going on here because this implies that very exergonic reactions are going to have then the reaction where delta G is equal to negative lambda. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here we have a case where the free energy change of the reaction is more negative than the negative of the reorganization energy. How does the representative point get from the equilibrium position of the reactant potential energy surface to the equilibrium position of the product potential energy surface? Well, it starts here. It has to actually move to the left. And then, and only then, can it cross over to the product potential energy surface and reach that equilibrium point. Notice that there's a barrier here and that that barrier is greater than it would be if our thermodynamic free energy difference were equal to the reorganization energy. In fact, that's the situation on the last slide right here. In this really interesting case where the place where the potential energy surfaces intersect is the equilibrium position of the D plus A well. In this situation, the thermodynamic free energy difference is the reorganization energy. And this is a barrierless situation. There is no activation barrier. This is the minimum possible value for the activation energy, and it goes up if we move to more exergonic reaction. And as we continue to pull down the product potential energy surface, well, imagine what that's going to do to this parabola and the intersection point. It's just going to send us up the D plus A potential energy surface and raise the barrier even further bizarre, because as we're getting more thermodynamically favorable, the reaction is slowing down. This was so strange that that region where that region of the thermodynamic free energy difference space, we might say, was given a special name, the Marcus inverted region, where the kinetics are inverted relative to our intuitive expectation about the relationship between kinetics and thermodynamics. And the two big conclusions here are that number one, the activation energy is lowest, it's at a minimum, and the rate is at a maximum when the thermodynamic free energy difference is equal to the reorganization energy, the solvent reorganization energy. The second big conclusion is the Marcus inverted region, that eventually we will reach a point where the barrier starts to go up as we get more and more exothermic or exergonic in reaction. And this is actually great news for photo-induced electron transfer. One question we haven't asked yet but is really worth meditating on is why in the world don't d dot plus and a dot minus immediately undergo a back electron transfer process what we might abbreviate as b et for back electron transfer to give neutral dna in their ground states this seems like it would be heavily thermodynamically favored right since we're going from a radical cation and anion back to ground state dna and it is it is heavily thermodynamically favored. But thanks to the Marcus inverted region, it's just slow. It's so favorable thermodynamically that it is prohibitively slow. In many cases, not in all cases, sometimes we do fall victim to the problem of back electron transfer. But as a general rule, and assuming Marcus theory holds, back electron transfer is often very slow, in particular relative to reactions of the radical cation or the radical anion, for example. We can often take advantage of reactions of these species without worrying so much about back electron transfer, thanks to Marcus theory. Now, we can finally come back to the data of Rim and Weller that we looked at a few videos ago, which is not consistent with the Marcus model. Let's remind ourselves of that and see what the Marcus model would predict. The Marcus model predicts that the activation barrier goes up for strongly exergonic electron transfer processes. That would correspond to a slowing of the rate constant for quenching, as you see represented by this dotted line right here. That's not observed in this data. Diffusional or diffusion controlled quenching is observed way, way down to very strongly exergonic electron transfer reactions. The reasons for this were not entirely clear, and Rim and Weller were invested in trying to retain the features of Marcus theory while still explaining this data. It took a long time for the literature and for the data we had available to catch up with Marcus's predictions. 
And 30 years after his initial report, sometime in the 1980s, I believe, he was finally vindicated. The data I'm showing you here is from a 2020 paper that also demonstrates the existence of the Marcus inverted region. What we can do is actually turn this data around with more exergonic reactions on the left and more endergonic reactions on the right. And here, very clearly, you can see the Marcus inverted region coming in. What's plotted on the y-axis is a rate constant for electron transfer. And you can see that when we get down around negative 2, negative 2.5 electron volts, the rate of electron transfer demonstrably slows. These were situations where great experimental care was taken to ensure that the rate of electron transfer specifically was being measured and not some other process that may be occurring alongside electron transfer, which was more or less the proposal of Rim and Weller. And so Marcus has been vindicated. It took a long time for this to happen, but it's good news for photoinduced electron transfer on some level because strongly exergonic electron transfer processes, such as between a radical cation and a radical anion sitting right next to each other, can often be relatively slow.